This video is part of the Sharing Your Research Workshop series for graduate students and early career researchers. Some examples will be targeted toward this group, but overall this video will provide a good introduction to managing your research data. To start, let me introduce myself. My name is Chelsea Boley, and I'm the Scholarly Communication Librarian at Texas Women's University. I'm here as a resource and collaborator for the TWU community. I provide education and training on open access and publishing, copyright consultations, and can help you with finding an open access journal or, or drafting a data management plan. If you're a student, faculty, or staff member of TWU, please do contact me with any questions regarding academic publishing, open access, copyright, and data management plans. This talk and slides are licensed CC BY. I hope from this workshop video you'll learn something useful and put into practice with your own research, that you'll be inspired to share your research data, and that you'll tell me what you'd like to learn about in future workshops. Before we really get started, let's talk about how we're defining research data. Research data includes both quantitative and qualitative data that you collect during your research. This could be raw data generated from instruments, statistics, figures, code, interviews, and transcripts. I want to highlight this because you might not automatically consider your code or transcripts to be data, but they are, and there are methods to manage and share all kinds of data. You've likely been working hard gathering and analyzing your data on your personal computer, or perhaps even a laboratory one, but do you have the data properly stored and backed up? Through this talk, I want you to gain some direction to avoid a data horror story. Like if the data can't be found, or it's gone, entirely. Data loss can be tragic for any researcher, but if you're a PhD student, data loss can mean not completing your dissertation on time. Let's talk about a few steps you can take to prevent a data horror story for yourself. The first step is to organize. To organize, you need to create a system for how you want to organize your data. If you're working with collaborators, be sure to have a conversation with them and agree on a system plan. Having multiple systems could be as detrimental to your organization as having no system at all. And always use file version control, particularly if you're working from multiple computers or with collaborators. When organizing your data and other parts of your research, take on the perspective of an outsider to the project and ask yourself, will someone be able to guide through my folders? Will someone be able to logically locate my samples or datasets? Your individual organizational system may work great right now and make sense to you, but would they make sense to your collaborators, research advisor, or to others? What about you in five years or even a month? Name folders and files specifically. For example, instead of just putting all your research samples in a general research folder in your giant documents folder, separate out your research. Label it with a grant number, research site, type of data, and name the data file meaningfully. Let's say you're a student conducting research on the biodiversity of Lake Travis. Part of your data are images of your samples. In this example, we created a folder named after the grant, specified the research project and location with Lake Travis Biodiversity, another folder named Images to specify the content and type of data, and finally, a meaningfully named file, Travis underscore 20160412.tiff, meaning the image was taken on April 12, 2016, adding a layer description to your file name. When naming your files, you want to name meaningfully. Be consistent, descriptive, and short. Don't simply name it file12935 or stick with a name that your software auto-generated for you. One method is to name it with project, instrument, and location, if applicable, and then the date. You don't have to conform to this method of file naming, but this can be a good guide for you when determining how you want to name your files. Find what works for you, your research project, and your data but remember to be meaningful, consistent, descriptive, and short. The next step is to use open file formats for your data and other research outputs. Choose open file formats rather than file formats from proprietary software. This means using TXT over DOCX and CSV over XSLX. I recommend this because some file formats are less likely to become obsolete. Open file formats have a history of wide adoption and backward compatibility. Saving your data spreadsheet as an XSLX Microsoft Excel file may not mean you can open it in a few years, whether because Microsoft Excel changes or you no longer own the software. Even if previous software versions can be open, the data may not display the same way. Additionally, when working with images, TIFF is a better file format than JPEG for long-term long storage. Additionally, when working with images, TIFF is a better file format than JPEG for long-term storage. As you go through your research process, collecting and analyzing data, be sure to document. 
We've already discussed organization and file naming, which will be helpful steps toward great documentation for your project. At the project and folder levels, you can benefit from having a README file. When you create your README file, it should contain names and contact information for project researchers, lists of files and corresponding descriptions, copyright and other licensing information, and funding sources. In short, your README file should contain all the basic information someone would need to know and understand the contents of your research project folder. This README file is especially useful if you share your research, whether that be with a collaborator, future student, or another researcher interested in your data. As you go through the research process, document any data processing and analysis. The how of your research is incredibly important. By documenting your process, you will help any future verification of your results, make your process clear if you share your data, and these notes will also be helpful when you're writing up your research methods section of your dissertation. This documentation means including your written notes as well. If you have a notebook, keep it as a hard copy, and then transcribe or scan your written notes so that you have additional copies of your re important research process. And as always, when documenting, use descriptive names. And now we come to one of the most important parts of research data management, backing up your data. Storage does not equal backup. Often people think that they're safe with a simple storage solution or a one copy on an external hard drive. Storage is for your working files, the files you access regularly. If you lose storage, it would mean losing current versions of your data. However, backing up is the regular process of copying data. You don't need your backup until you lose your data, but if this happens, your backup can save your research project. Be sure to have regular, routine process of copying your data to ensure a proper backup. A good rule to follow when managing your data is a rule of three. Keep three copies of your data two copies on site and one copy off site. A typical example of this is a copy on your laptop, a copy on an external hard drive, and utilizing cloud storage. The rule of three is incredibly important. Hard drives break, you might spill a drink on your laptop, someone may steal your laptop. There could even be a fire or a natural disaster that ruins the equipment your data is stored on. You may never need your backup, but if you do, being prepared will save your research project. When determining how you want to fill the rule of three, evaluate your storage options. Ask yourself what is the best option for your research project. What kind of storage suits your type of data? You may have a small data set from anthropological interviews or a giant data set from your high energy physics research. Different storage solutions will suit different types of data. You can select cloud storage for one of your rule of three copies, but remember, there isn't really a cloud. The cloud is just someone else's computer or more specifically, likely a server within a very large warehouse somewhere in the world. Customers have experienced data loss from cloud storage options. For example, a lightning strike at a warehouse caused damage to servers, resulting in data loss. It's rare, but it isn't out of the realm of possibilities. A company may also close, and you may miss the opportunity to transfer your data, particularly if an old or junk email address is associated with the account. Usually, cloud service providers are good, but you're trusting a company with keeping your data safe. This can present problems both with long-term storage and complying with privacy requirements. If you choose to select a cloud service to help manage your data, carefully evaluate it as you should with all storage options. The final recommended step for data management is to make a plan. If you're already in the middle of your research project, make a plan now, but it's best to draft your research data management plan prior to beginning your research. There are a few tools to draft data management plans, and the one I'd recommend to you is the DMP tool, which you can use for free at dmptool.org. Research data management plans should outline where the data will be stored, organized, and how it will be named. Additionally, it should include the roles and responsibilities of all the involved researchers, and your plan to store and disseminate your research. Data management plans are now required by some funders, so learning how to draft a data management plan early on in your career will be advantageous. Additionally, if you're funded by a federal agency, there's a good chance that you have to share your data, so including how you want to disseminate your data will be a crucial part of your data management plan. A stronger data management plan will make for stronger research. If you would like to draft a data management plan, I can help you. Just make a consultation appointment with me. I'm happy to work with you if you're on campus in Denton or online if you're in Dallas, Houston, or a distance learner. Now let's talk about data sharing. Academic research is meant to increase knowledge and contribute to a greater understanding. By sharing your data, you can contribute at a deeper level. 
and potentially your research may be built upon by others or discover a new collaborator. Sharing your data can increase your visibility as a researcher. It provides another research output for your colleagues to notice, cite, and expand on. A common concern for researchers about data sharing is a fear that they'll be scooped. Let's use a Twitter interaction to discuss this fear. If you watched the first video in the series, Introduction to Open Access, you probably remember Dr. Erin McKernan, the researcher who pledged to be open, including with her data. She got a response from Matthew Wold on Twitter asking, are you worried that someone will find something in your data that you missed and then they get the glory? Another open researcher, Richard Smith Unin, replied, if Erin McKernan missed it and nobody else ever saw the data, the world missed out on the knowledge and nobody got the glory. I love this interaction because it focuses on the benefits of research and contributing to the greater good of knowledge. Scooping can be a real concern. If you're more comfortable, then of course wait until you finish writing your dissertation or publishing the two articles you're going to get out of the data set. But if you're done with your data and you don't have any immediate plans to continue exploring it, then share it. There may be new discoveries that come out of it. To borrow from Figshare, sharing your data gets you credit for all your research. Often the only research output from a project you gain is a publication. This is an important output, but you're missing out on getting credit for all your research. Data sets can also be cited, and by sharing your data, you can provide another research output that can be discovered. You also have the option to publish your data. There are data journals and data repositories where you can make your data available formally with a data paper or archive your data. Data repositories are available through many institutions, but a disciplinary repository may be best for your research. You can find a disciplinary repository at re3data.org. Figshare.com is also a great option for a general data repository. Data is not copyrightable, and the best practice is to license it under a Creative Commons Zero license. If you wish to make your data available, here are a few good repositories to start with. Xenodoo and Dryad are a great option for scientific and medical data. The Open Science Framework and Figshare are repository solutions for all disciplines and are free. Let's take a brief look at Figshare. You can visit Figshare at Figshare.com. Through Figshare, you can store, share, and discover research. Figshare is a good repository solution for you as a graduate student or early career researcher because it's free to use up to a certain storage limit. And you can deposit figures, data sets, posters, papers, presentations, and your thesis, and even code. It's a great option to put all your research outputs in one place. Plus, you'll have the added benefit of getting a free DOI that you can gain Elmetric data from. If you watched a previous workshop video on measuring impact, you'll know this can be great for learning how your research is being shared and used. Let's take an example of a poster. Viewers can look at a poster. Here you can see the views and downloads and the metric score of 47. Now let's take a look at the author's profile to see an example of how a Figshare profile looks like. There's a picture, ORCID, biographical information, and social media contacts. Publications are listed, and then public data, in this case posters, are displayed below. If you create a Figshare profile and deposit your data, whether it is a paper, data set, posters, it'll display like this. Again, Figshare can be a nice solution for you if you want to deposit all your research outputs together, but another repository solution may be useful for you, or a disciplinary repository may be more appropriate for your research. I've discussed the benefits of data sharing, that you'd be contributing to greater knowledge and getting credit for all your research, but there's also a proven citation advantage. Here you see she's jumping for joy over data citations. Okay, maybe there isn't actually any corresponding data to confirm that is why she's jumping, but if you benefit from citation advantage after sharing your data, you'll probably be jumping for joy. I'm hoping after this video workshop, you'll want to draft a data management plan and share your data. If you need help starting your research data management, I'm here as a resource. I can support you with consultations, helping you draft a data management plan, discuss publication options, discuss if or when you want to make your data open, and refer data repositories. Again, if you have any questions, get in touch. You can get more information through the TWU Library Guide at libguides.twu.edu slash rdm. If you haven't already viewed the other workshops in this series, click through to view them or find the link in the video description on YouTube.